goodness, uh, one in four elderly folks have one form or the other chronic ailment, which is uh, 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 data that is available across, uh, be it diabetes or hypertension or you know, stroke or some form of the heart diseases. You know, uh, if these uh, chronic ailments are not well attended to, and which is what we are seeing as a trend in uh, some of the elderly the population, it leads to, you know, challenges in physical activity and uh, uh, not able to keep this chronic ailment under control is a problem. Welcome to the Blue Circle and thank you all for joining in today. It's such a big privilege and a pleasure to reconnect with everyone, our distinguished panelists who are handpicked because of the think input they bring in and the rich experience they also bring in. And uh, thank you to our distinguished audience for joining us once again. Uh, we've received over 150 CXO registrations, most of whom are leaders. Uh, many of them are repeat visitors to our webinars, so, which is very encouraging and, and motivates us to provide even higher levels of dialogue through the online channels as well. And for those of you who are new with us today, the Blue Circle is an exclusive community and ecosystem curated for business leaders to help them manage disruptive times and become future ready. We focus on four fundamental sectors, which are healthcare, energy, e-mobility, and real estate. We also present socioeconomic insights, which ultimately determine the evolving complexion of the market. In response to the COVID challenge, the Blue Circle has also accentuated its digital presence. One of the many modes we employ is our weekly webinar series and our digital publication. And in, uh, in addition to this, uh, you will be happy to know that we will very soon be launching an exclusive digital platform curated for leaders, somewhat like the LinkedIn for leaders, wherein we will present them with the opportunity of connecting with people just like them, also house High, high quality curated content, meaningful conversations and business opportunities focused within these four sectors. So those leaders who are interested, please do write to us. We've already begun our selective outreach and within a month we've, 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 uh, we are privileged to have over 500 CXOs signed up on the platform. And the topic for today's session is elderly care, unmet needs and the path forward. India has nearly 120 million elderly people with various physical, psychosocial, and economic problems. Both private and government organizations and other agencies which provide daycare, home care, old age home care, and palliative care need to spruce up their act so that these services become affordable and attractive to all the elderly. We are privileged enough to have invited industry leaders to discuss the unmet needs and the way forward in the elderly care space. I will just quickly briefly mention their respective names and designations so we can begin. We have with us Mr. Raja Gopal Ji, founder and CEO Kite Senior Care, Mr. Rajit Mehta, MD and CEO Antara Senior Living, Mr. Prateep Sen, co-founder Tribeca Care, Mr. Rohit Bayana, managing partner and co-founder Loomis Partners, and the chair and moderator for the session is Mr. Pavan Chaudhary, best-selling author, CEO of French multinational Wygon India, chairman Medical Technology Association of India and sits on several boards across the country. Welcome, sirs. And kindly note that we will have Q&A towards the end of the session. Some of you already shared excellent questions. They're already with the chair and the moderator. And now I request Mr. Chaudhary to please begin and moderate the session, sir. Great, thank you, Siddharth, and welcome everybody. Longevity is a fundamental hallmark of civilization progress. However, longevity also brings its challenges because by its meaning, longevity is extension of that part of life which is frail and fraught with many a climb. So a lot depends on how a treat how society treats its old a lot of that depends on what is the usefulness of the old people and on the society's values if you look at the process of aging or how we take elder care from this perspective it's a very wide angled view we will go into various hues of this spectrum 
uh, later. Today, let us begin with what are the challenges which elderly people face? What are the physical challenges, the social challenges, the psychological challenges and the economic challenges which the elderly people face? And what some path-breaking companies in a couple of genres are doing to help them overcome these challenges. So this is the broad context of this first session on senior care, which is actually a favorite among many of us. So let me start the session with Raj. Raj, what are the main physical challenges which the elderly face? Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chaudhary, for this opportunity. Um, physical challenges is one of the very important uh, problems, and uh, I would like to highlight a few of them, and that which we encounter very frequently while dealing with the elderly folks. Uh, the most important is the reduced physical activity, you know, this post-retirement as a concept that comes in. I think uh, we are actually observing even people who have been holding very high offices, uh, a sedentary lifestyle setting in. And of course, which ultimately leads to uh, you know depressive state. Now, uh, this COVID, you know, uh, in fact, uh, has opened up a lot of uh, 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 has provided a lot of thought process in terms of this physical activity because many of the elderly folks have actually been uh, you know confined to the walls of uh, uh, in a room and they are not even able to get out uh, unless they were in a larger community, etc. So, uh, reduced physical activity, uh, we are seeing that is a big concern amongst elderly people. Um, there are other factors which I want to highlight here, few of them. Uh, chronic illness, uh, one in four elderly folks have one form or the other chronic ailment, which is uh, uh, a data that is available across, uh, be it diabetes or hypertension or you know, stroke or some form of the heart diseases. You know, uh, if these uh, chronic ailments are not well attended to, and which is what we are seeing as a trend in uh, some of the elderly, the population, it leads to you know challenges in physical activity and uh, not able to keep this chronic ailment under control is a problem. Then comes your frailty and decline in cognitive. Uh, as you age, because you have this uh, concept of young, old and old and old, uh, as you move from young, old category to old and old, frailty and decline in cognitive. And we are seeing a lot of people who are coming out in the open and talking about dementia uh, and other forms of psychiatric illness, while dementia is a neurogenerative disease. Uh, these frailty and decline in cognitive impacts the physical well-being. About 20% of elders face challenges with at least uh, one of the lack of one of the activities of daily living. Uh, very important other point is the poor infrastructure in India, which is not helping at all uh, uh, with the mobility of the elderly folks. As you can see, your common uh, uh, areas are not accessible to the elderly, especially with frailty or some challenges that they have. Your roads are not very safe for them to drive or even walk across. So I think a poor infrastructure uh, again pushes back people into their confines, which again leads to you know isolation from social activity and thereafter uh, therefore depression, etc. Uh, most importantly, and the final point I want to make here is, uh, I think India has to grow towards talking about preventive health in the elderly. This is something that I've seen very extensively. Uh, you know, well articulated and uh, properly practiced in some of the Western countries or in the Far Eastern countries. A lack of preventive, structured preventive health program, and the most important word is active aging, is something that we have to bear in mind. I see all these factors lead to a lot of physical challenges in the elderly, and some of the new age companies are trying to work around these concepts. In fact, for example, if you look at our vibrant retirement communities, some of these factors are addressed over there. Uh, so, in all, I think a lack of uh, you know, understanding of preventive health and active aging as a philosophy is a fundamental to many of the physical challenges that the elderly face. Excellent. What a, what a beautiful and comprehensive start. You have spoken about active aging and that active lifestyle opportunities, of course, safe and active lifestyle opportunities should be provided to the elderly to improve their quality of life. Chronic ailments you have spoken about, you have spoken about gerontological deficiencies, you have alluded towards things like skeletal uh, weakness, osteoporosis, etc. You have spoken about the infrastructural deficiencies which can cause fractures, etc. even because of a, 
a severe bump in the road uh, 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 in an elderly and perhaps there is also the course of the disease also is a physical piece the course of the disease is atypical in old elderly people it is unclear it is many a times faster it is multi pathology and it gives rise to polytherapy and also uh, elderly patients are not so uh, strong to hemostatically that means resume normalcy after a medication error so which is also quite common all over the world also in india so these are some of the physical challenges with elderly patients uh, face fantastic start raj thank you uh, let me come to the mental side the psychological uh, uh, the psychological side and let me uh, pull in raj rajit here rajit sure sure thank you bhavan glad to be on this forum and as all of us speak uh, obviously you realize that there's a deep connect between social psychological and physical challenges a very interesting survey we did recently about 2000 elders across north west and south and for the first time i saw a very high number of people living alone 77% of the people that we surveyed were staying independently some out of choice some out of force uh and therefore you know this the issue that we notice in the elderly of high need for affiliation and this feeling of irrelevance you know is one of the biggest challenges you know they are dealing with many years back they were the center stage all decisions were flowing through them they were master of their own you know life and suddenly they find that the kith and kin has taken over and uh, they are only talked to when need you know and that that is causing a very odd you know uh, challenge and therefore the reflection in terms of eating disorders sleeping disorders you know depression anxiety you know, that's an obvious cause the second you know i would say is this uh, uh, lack of resonance between what the mind wants to do and what the body is capable of doing uh, so there's constant push and pull uh, that many things they want to do in terms of traveling you know sports activities uh, the mind things they are capable of doing however the physical body is not what it used to be and this leads to a sense of helplessness which again goes back to causing some of the anxiety disorders the third one which is also peculiar to india and many developing countries is that you know unlike the western world where there are systems and processes and and various products to fund retirement none of those solutions are available so therefore this feeling of you know financial helplessness that while the life expectancy has gone up unfortunately the mechanisms you know to be able to fund retirement and we don't even have comprehensive insurance policies which cover rehabilitation or care at home or assisted living so that's the other thing we are noticing as a high concern area again leading to anxiety the last one i would mention is there is you know already in india a very high incidence of comorbidities amongst the elderly about 17% uh, you know reported dementia cases we all know from our experience it's largely under reporting 40% cardiac issues diabetes and visual you know impairment uh, so the chronic illnesses are also causing a certain amount of psychological pressure you know on the elderly uh, compared to physical ailments you know which are easily recognizable they can report you can do a test etc unfortunately the mental issues are either under reported or it's a taboo and therefore we find that we are able to catch them at a very very late stage so it's a very odd you know combination of all this which is causing uh, you know my mental disorders sleeping disorders anxiety depression feeling of loneliness uh, which we are battling with there are several ways of addressing it but we are finding this is now becoming very accentuated and covid has not helped at all i mean uh, there are several neighbors i know we who live you know right next to us where their kids are abroad and they won't even weren't even able to take care of their essentials right so the covid has put some extra pressure on them uh, this is you know is a, is a flavor that we are noticing uh, of the issues that the elderly are facing excellent points excellent points rajit and i would like to uh, pick up one of those which i like the most among all the good ones so sure. when what the mind wants to do the body is not willing to do and why is the mind wanting and which is where perhaps one of the influencers there is ageism ageism as you know is discrimination and stereotyping on the basis of age 
that you are looked at maybe as less less productive or frail etc and this kind of ageism puts pressure on us that even when your walk is no longer youthful walk youthfully or on women who have a, who fight a tremendous pun, tremendously punishing and losing battle to against their wrinkles against sagging skin etc because you want to be not to be seen as youthful youth is at a, is at a premium and mm-hmm. it has drawn an other category uh, all prejudice is based on othering other race other nation other uh, uh, religion this prejudice is extremely dangerous because here the other is us we are coming there so we should be very careful uh, uh, in in uh, unconsciously collectively exerting this pressure of ageism where people do not want to be seen as old uh, i think the yellow leaf of season of life we should do something so that it, it starts looking like the golden leaf season of life also coming to pratip pratip what what do you think are the social challenges which elderly face we have heard the mental mental and the physical what are the social challenges they face no pavan right uh, and uh, you know there is always a risk of repeating right the reason is that in when we are talking about elder you know issues is often like what you know what's that uh, Uh, Leo Tolstoy and Anna Karenina, right? Which said, "Happy families are all alike, and unhappy families are different in uh, in different ways." Right? Again, it, what really happens out here is when we are young, all our different parts are working together. Your faculties are working together. Health is good. You're meeting tons of people. You're going to school, so you're meeting people, right? So all of those things are happening together. But when you get older, something falters, right? It could be health which starts off. It could be you don't have friends it could be the death of someone and suddenly that sort of cascades that little one thing that sort of cascades and suddenly what you have is an a senior person or an elderly person cooped up in a room again like what rajit was saying living alone 77% living alone and not being able to do right and when you look at all the reasons as to why she can't go out it could be one of a myriad of reasons right i think the fundamental one that happens and i think it's again the social aspect that happens uh, Uh, Pavan, which is that you know when you are young you can make friends, right? Our ability to make friends decreases over time. Right? At, at some point when you get married, you come into a, a nuclear family, are only focused on kids, and suddenly you come out of this entire you know uh, this machinery of making and and bringing up a child, and suddenly you're sixty years old. You worked very hard, and what really happens is that. you don't have any friends right or you've sort of parted from your friends it's a transferable job so i think fundamentally it is when you sort of come back after you know the age of 60 but a lot of people have friends a lot of people find it difficult to make friends right i think that's what again when you look at the social side what happens i guess is you know us very similar to i guess china with you know very few kids happening and again the numbers say it right right now i think there is one out of every 10 or 11 is a senior in about 15 years it's going to be about i think one in six or something like that which means to say that people are working you know all next you know friends family everyone is sort of moved off to a different place and as a result what happens is that who's this elderly person who's sitting at home going to talk to when their you know son daughter is in a different city friends are no longer there so again this one this multi generational family has sort of moved away into a nuclear family and because at least let's say in calcutta every kid every mother wants to get their child to become an engineer or a doctor and where does he get a job he probably gets a job in a different country different city right and suddenly she's left you know, right at the same time i think what happens is that retirement right retirement is another big thing retirement at 58 or 60 made sense and i think uh, uh, uh large sort of mentioned it but now people are living till about 80 85 and longer right medicines and everything coming up like longevity and there is i think a formula somewhere which says that for every person if you can you know how long your parents have lived you'll know that you'll probably live unless you have some issue right cancer hits you covid hits you something like that you will probably live a little more than your parents right? and then 
what is this person who's retired at 60 going to do all the way till the time that he's 90? And it's not only the boredom or not being able to do anything. So he falls off the cliff at that time. But it's also, again, you know, what Rajat was saying, how will he sustain himself, right? How will he actually make his money go that distance when in the past it would be enough to go up to, let's say, 70, 75, right? So I think a lot of this, again, death in the family, mobility issues, sensory issues, one little thing, the person doesn't want to go out, right? We had this you know, lady in, in, in Tribeca who would go out and do the local bazaar and all of that. One fine day, she had a little, she didn't even fall. She had this little you know, trip and she, someone sort of held on to her, but that pure psychosis sort of hits her and then she again stays at home. And now no one is willing to come home. She has to wait for someone to come home. And there are no caregivers to take us somewhere. You need the money to get a car to send somewhere somewhere else. So this entire infrastructure, health, yeah. that sort of comes together. And that's when these people very quickly, and we've seen this vicious cycle. It's actually a vicious cycle, right? Which starts with one small thing, right? Of this lady having a slight fall, because of which she doesn't go out, because of which she doesn't use her muscles, because of which... Her, her mental framework is actually, you know, she's feeling bad about, you know, she's getting scared to go out. And now she's eating because she is depressed. Her, she's put on weight, her knees are going, and that vicious cycle happens. Within a year's time, she's sitting at home and not being able to go out, right? So that's essentially what's happening in this space. Is, is well, reality. you know, you have really, Pratip, you've gone to the meat of the issue. One element which you have touched is the the loneliness which comes because of relocations, elderly people have to relocate maybe after retirement or to a child's home or to for better climate, they relocate. So they lose friends and the society has kind of prepared some labels which they are very, which, sub, which are subliminal and they, they feel those very strongly. They feel that if they do not have friends, then somewhere they have been socially inept. Just as every wrinkle and every ache makes me feel that uh, am I aging successfully or not? Uh, similarly, every uh, lonely moment makes elderly feel that did I live a properly well-balanced social life or not? So secondly, you've said that women have started working. So if women... Earlier, women were looking after the elderly and they were providing that company to the elderly. But now because women are also working, they are even lonely at home. Thirdly, they are for the first time receiving care and not giving care to their children. And Khalil Gibran had said that when a father gives to the son, both are happy. But when a son gives to the father, both are unhappy. And it might be material giving or it might be caregiving. And the last point, which I think you alluded to, and I would like to amplify before I go to Rohit, is dealing with family also can be a complicated matter for many seniors. There can be leftover feelings of resentment and anger and unresolved issues which need to be worked through. So personal boundaries may need to be drastically redefined or some other changes in relationship dynamics need to be uh, need to be affected and that also causes some level of social uh, unre uh, social discomfort great points prateep coming to rohit rohit you have you are an investor in the elder care space also you have very fair and a very good understanding of psychological issues which might be coming because of financial constraints. So I would like to ask you, in your experience, what do you think are the most biggest economic challenges for the elderly? Rohit. Sure, Bhavan. Happy to be here, Bhavan. <clears throat> Bhavan, I think no one anywhere in any country around the world has seen the kind of cycles that we will see in India of aging. First, we were always, so to speak, a young country, which we are not, by the way. Second, a country which is without truly a social infrastructure, be it a pension plan, be it a 
universal income plan, be it 911, none of those social infrastructures exist in India. That's the second part. Third, if you just see the rate of growth of the ceiling and the floor with which the senior population has expanded in this country, it's not expanded anywhere else. The quality of life improvement, the access to medication, all of that has caused that senior population to really expand here. And I, I, I use these numbers often. The country is growing 17% on a decadal growth rate. Seniors are growing on a 35% decadal growth rate. The kind of stress that causes on a country which used to call a five-year planning cycle, but even if it did have that five-year planning cycle, I don't think it's valid anymore. Even if you were to do 15-year planning cycles, I think by the time we get down to India looking at how will in 2030, forget 2050, how will in 2030 this country's pyramid of demographics look like? And therefore, how many hundred million people will be sitting where? And how many of them will have access to care or access to pension or access to services? I think it's genuinely a massive problem. It's a problem of proportions which a US didn't have to face. US had its baby boomers boom happening at a time when the country was growing and the age curve was slowly expanding. Europe was totally the opposite. It was already a mature economy and therefore it could balance its resources accordingly. It could create national resource plans like public and national income, universal income, access to care, all of that, like NHS in US, sorry, in UK or other parts of Europe. Japan had a totally different problem altogether. Longevity was known very much ahead in time and they could plan resources accordingly. We have all the things happening together. Everything is happening together. We are aging, we are, our volume of aging is higher, our, our population is still booming, our resources are fragile, we don't have those kind of planning. Uh, the DNA of this country doesn't allow that kind of planning cycles. I therefore think we are we will have to create this country. And, and, and Pavan, I'm leaning on both the points you said, psychological as well as economic, and also kind of leaning into what, what the others, other panelists said. I think India will have to quickly get to a point where India very clearly understands what's public and what's private sector with the aging curriculum in mind. Because aging is one place, Pavan, where we cannot say the discussion is about actually all the four topics you touched. It's not social, psychological, physical, or economic. It's actually a continuum. In, in some of the best aging countries, Scandinavia and Canada, two principal, and to some extent, New Zealand, three. I wouldn't count the rest of Europe and I wouldn't count US. In these three parts of the world, geriatry is not a medical science. Geriatry is medical plus economic plus physiological. It's all the three things coming together. And that is because they understand that one big thing that comes together when people start to age is worry. Worry is endemic. You, there's something that happens in your body, just like melatonin. There's something that happens in your body when, when it gets sun and you know, melatonin comes into play. There's something that happens in your body when a clock turns and worry becomes endemic and natural. And what all that causes from physical to physiological to somatic to everything. And on top of that, you're losing income. On top of that, you're like you all said, your relevance to society and, and wherever you were in your, you know, in your stratosphere, in your hierarchy and where you're coming down to. I think all those perfect storms are coming together. So to my mind, actually, for a moment, forget the base of the pyramid, forget the below poverty line, forget the socially impoverished. Even if you come to middle class India. I think we are staring at a big demographic problem, which has economic issues related to it, which has physiological and psychological issues related to it, and aging is stamped all over it. So I, I think we have a we have a pretty big issue. The good thing is, for as entrepreneurial as this country is now wearing the investor headset, as entrepreneurial as this country is, from Pratip to Rajit to Raj and you know everyone else that I come across. I think the Jugaad factor will take over like nowhere else. I think we'll end up we'll end up creating sometimes with public partnerships and most of the time without them because regulation obviously is hugely amiss. But we'll end up creating structures which will take care of this. Now the point which worries me is in the vacuum of regulation, trust doesn't come easy. So the problem isn't stopping. Regulation doesn't exist. 
trust doesn't come easy public sector private sector is willing to step in and yet you don't have you don't have the right frameworks on which you can enable their playground so that's i'm sorry you asked me very specific economic but i went a little broader uh, but that's how i feel about it no no i th- I, th- i think um you went just just the right uh, manner you covered the economic side and you covered it with the um, what adam smith has said that the biggest problem is a financial problem and the biggest worry uh, i don't remember his exact word biggest worry is financial worry and you have told uh, you have narrated how this uh, can um, uh, can snowball uh, just to complement uh, the points which you made um the increasing healthcare cost and caregiving cost is one burden on the elder so elders have more or less become a expensive burden plus with the life sa- life spans increasing the caregiving child is also of often old so his his outgoes of expenditure have also increased and there is a tendency in many elders today because of insufficient savings to return to work then insurance is also not very well covering all the ailments they may suffer from and only a very small percentage is insured then there is the possibility of fraud which also is often played uh on them by usually their one of their relatives or even their ch- child and plus some uh, planning which they have done for their old age is also uh, susceptible to changing interest rates etc but i feel that you you spoke extremely well and you said the uh, broad birds i view picture uh, coming back to eurohit uh, so that in the interest of equity we begin now with you what is what are the organizations uh, generically in which you have invested what are they doing to handle all these problems which you raj pratip and rajit uh, mentioned or which part of these problems are attempted to be handled by these organizations which you have invested in rohit sure sure so so pavan uh... given by the sentiment i shared with you i truly believe that since it's a continuum since it cannot be segregated between psychological medical so on and so forth also it cannot be segregated by condition so what we are doing pavan is we are we're trying to put a few things very clearly in front of us one of which is which is literally the founding principle of our thought process is that when you age you you can't if you're catering to elders you cannot cherry pick you cannot cherry pick you have to look at clinical and non clinical you'll have to look at physical and digital you can't shy away from operations it's a messy business it's it's transactionally heavy it's operationally heavy uh it's liability heavy so few r- rules of the game that typically we would apply on ourselves when we are looking at investments we practically busted all those rules so we would typically say hey we will not do real estate we had to uh we typically would do we won't get into spaces and segments where regulation doesn't exist we had to if we, if we want to get into this so effectively therefore what we said was you still need some structure right if i'm saying we'll do clinical and non clinical we'll do physical and digital we'll not be operationally shy we will not cherry pick we'll do what it takes how do we segment it still because somewhere at the end of the day you still got to segment it so the way we decided to segment it was basically two stages of living with independence either you're aging in place you're aging in your own home and and i think pratip said it and and you you alluded to it very well pavan when you said that when people move out all the changes that happen all the stress and and, and psychological trauma it creates so one of the big big factors we have enshrined in our mind is that can you enable elders to age in place irrespective of where their kids have gone where their friends have gone the weather is better or worse or whatever home is the most precious place it might be in a 47 degree celsius temperature without friends or wherever it is without family home is home 
So can we help them age in place? And that becomes the bedrock of technology and services. The second segment is they will come a stage in life when assisted living needs will become so acute that even with care services streamed into home, as we've all gotten used to during COVID, however much we provide on the back of technology, we provide an attendant and a nurse and we provide sensors and technology and we can surround and wrap the home, there'll come a time when still that might not be enough for few 1%. Can we therefore give them a home-like environment which really becomes aging in hubs? So aging in place and aging in hubs is how we are cutting it for ourselves. Aging in place, as I said, is beaming services on the back of technology, internet-based consumption, from everything which is manpower-based to product-based to sensors and technology to caregiving, everything. And aging in hubs is a very home-like environment where very carefully masked nursing, deep nursing care is provided to people who cannot be cured to elders who cannot be cured. If it's cure, it's the department of hospitals. But if it is not cured and it is care and that to its long-term care, things which come with dementia and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and bipolar and all that, things which do not shorten your age span, you will still live as long. It's just that you're so constrained that if you were to age either in hospitals or in your own homes, it will be very emotionally draining. And therefore, how do you move that into aging in hubs in very well-cloaked home-like environments? So that's, that's how we are looking at our, at, our, at our spectrum. Excellent. You have very sensitively pointed out that home is where the heart is. Living in familiar surroundings is what the elderly wants. Hanging out, if possible, with familiar people savoring life's important memories, which have happened in that space. So that was a great point you made. And also ensuring that safety as well as socialization and care keeps on happening uh, through the technological route. And if ultimately you have to move out, then you move out to, uh, to a surrounding and I'll come to that after I've gone to Prateep, uh, to a surrounding which is very home-like, which you said house-based care. Great points, uh, Rohit. Prateep, in what you are doing, how are you handling generically the challenge? How's your industry handling generically the challenges which were discussed in the first round by all your other three panelists and you? Prateep. So, so, so thanks a lot, Papa. Right. So, and, and I think uh, Roy sort of, you know, built out the landscape very, very well. Again, there is the independent living or aging in place, and you know, assisted living come, you know, what aging in hub that he mentioned, right? And I think you actually do the entire gamut of services. It has to be a combination of these, right? Again, what happens is people would prefer to be in their own homes in the beginning. And at some point when things become bad, but they would need a place to actually, you know, where the, the level of nursing actually can actually go up, especially when there is dementia and other things, uh, right? So I think the, the way that at least, you know, when you think about what used to happen in our homes 20 years back, 30 years back, right? and this is a question to the, to the entire uh, team out here. How many of you think you're going to die Right, and I, I think that a lot of people will put up their hands saying that most probably they're going to die at home, but there's a very big chance, there's a very big probability, and I think I've done this many times, you'll find, uh, you know, as a palliative care nurse said, the way that most of us are going to die, maybe about 80, 90% of people are, it's going to be in a very antiseptic environment, in an ICU, in a hospital, right? But if you go back about 30 years, you would have, you know, there's some chanting going on. There is a person, you know, there's a doctor who's come and the person slowly, you know, there is people crying on the side, you know, and, and then the person sort of dies, right? That used to be the way that things used to be about 20, 30, maybe 40 years back, right? And I remember my grandmother going that, uh, that way. 
The reason was the infrastructure was that when doctors used to come home and you did not have that many hospitals down there. Right now, it's going to be this entire place. So right now, what happens in India is largely at home. If there's a problem, you take the person, you sort of put that person in an ambulance, you take them to the hospital, and then there's three or four you know, iterations of going to the hospital, coming back in periodicity of three months, six months, one year, whatever it is. And at some person, the person goes into an ICU and never comes back, right? That's the usual way that's it's today. And I think the, again, what will happen is that there'll be people actually like Raj who will create a lot of these infrastructure which will help people in the last, let's say three years, five years, seven years, something like this, right? And especially when things are. So because we've actually, you know, spent a lot of time on the independent uh, living side, uh, uh, and I, I came back to, you know, I was in London, I came back to India to start this about six years back. And the reason was my mother used to be alone and I used to wonder what to do with her and, you know, wake up in a sweat whenever, you know, a, a phone rang. But, and what I really tried to do was to replicate what a child would have done in India had he lived close by or not, right? And that's the entire thought process that we actually did. But in which, again, as, as Rohit said, you take a lot of, you know, the, you know, do you, do they need to go to the doctor? Do, you, do they need to have a maid coming in, a 24-hour person coming in? You know, you, you look after all the, uh, what's that, basic uh, activities of daily living. But in, in a lot of places, you take them out to the mandir or whatever it is, but you try to replicate that. And, and it's always been shown that living in your own home, especially when you're, you're younger, is a lot cheaper, right? So when there is no state funding that's happening, it is always better to be in your own home with your friends, family still coming over. And that is where I think a company such as ours, and I think, you know, there are, you know with Rohit and, you know, uh, Rajat now and then uh, and Raj, but it is how do you create that support? It's almost like the way that I look at it is that as, as a person gets older, they're living in their own homes, but they need support, right? And you start giving the low touch support in the beginning, you start creating a scaffolding around them. And over a period of time, the scaffolding becomes a lot stronger. And, and then, you know, when that can't last anymore, you probably need to take them to a place which is uh, solely meant, meant for, you know, an aging person, right? So that's the reason that we have looked at the whole thing. And then once you sort of do that, Pavan, you have to look at the medical side, you have to look at the non-medical side, you have to look at the social side. And that is something that you sort of, it's a, it's again a very gray area that you do, you know, it's not that you do A and not B, you have to actually work cross I hope Absolutely. that's your question. Absolutely. So taking the socio-medical history of the median elderly person, uh, you have designed your uh, product around that. And that is, uh, internationally, it has been seen that geriatric care starts with socio-medical history. So you've based your model on a very sound footing. Uh, great points, uh, Prateep. Coming to Rajit. Rajit, you are there in the entire spectrum of elder care. You have also headed the max group of hospitals. So you are in, in that acute, uh, you, you, you have experience of that piece also. Tell us that spectrum, entire spectrum of elder care in which you are, how are you handling the problems which Rohit, Raj and uh, Pratik spoke of? Uh, Rajit. Yeah. <laughs> There are two lenses we have taken to this entire thing. Uh, one lens is holistic wellness, which means if you look at the physical side, safety and security, the infrastructure, the emergency response systems, uh, the medical services, the access to a caregiver, uh, the tie-ups uh, for emergency care with hospitals, uh, the diet and physical activities, so the physical you know, part of the wellness. Second is the emotional and social, which is celebrations, festivities, uh, pursuing the hobby that you like, pottery, art. Art, by the way, is a, is a great therapy for people with mental disorders, you know, for example. Uh, counseling services, right? The next is, you know, uh, being able to satiate the intellectual part, which is access to books, libraries, or what we have noticed is people love to volunteer and they love to do things for their peers. I mean, the fascinating thing we find in elderly communities is that the people who are relatively younger in that community 
feel they can take care of the people who are a little more elderly in that community. So it's a great way of engaging them, you know, as well. And the last bit, you know, um, I think uh, I saw Pratib alluding to it is the spiritual side, which is the yoga, meditation, access to, you know, uh, spiritual teachers, the Vedanta classes, etc. So we have taken a holistic view. So whatever we do, we integrate four or five type of wellnesses, you know, into what, what, what we're doing. The second lens we have taken to this, to handle it is saying, what's the need of the individual keeping the social, economic, physiological needs? So if you are independent, uh, well, but want to stay in a community for care, comfort or companionship, we have residences for seniors. If you need help on a daily basis uh, for bathing, medication, monitoring, feeding, uh, mobility, you can stay in assisted living facilities. If you have some of the mental disorders, unfortunately, there are memory care facilities. And if you need all services in the comfort of your home, we can provide the same services at home. And if you need anything to support and aid your recovery, like a wheelchair or a walking stick or a diaper or a, or a shard chair or a hospital bed, we're able to provide that. So it's an integrated ecosystem. So it's a blend of life care and lifestyle offerings curated to the individual and the need. So that's the lens we have taken. Holistic wellness on one side, curated needs on one side and try to match them to create an integrated ecosystem, like a one-stop shop. And some parts we'll create on our own and some parts we'll have partnership and alliances. That's the way of approaching this. Wow. You know, I'm reminded that why, how did tribal and traditional societies treat their elders? Mm -hmm. They used to only abandon their elders when they were moving from one area to another area as nomads. And the elders were, could not walk, on the, walk, walk by themselves, so they had to be carried. So you had to choose whether you will carry the children or you will carry the adults. Mm -hmm. So that was one time when they used to abandon. And the other time when they used to abandon or sacrifice even their elders was at a time of food shortage. So, and elders at that time had a lot of utility. So they babysat, which elders do today also. I think you're also getting that done as volunteers. They still produce some food. They made tools, weapons, baskets, pots. They had knowledge of politics, medicine, religion, songs and dances. And also they knew about some rare events like pandemics because of their longer age. But today their utility has gone down and that is why their sense of self-esteem is also going down. Printing came, Google came, this all eroded that storehouse of knowledge and wisdom they were meant for. The technological piece also made them a kind of a little redundant or uh, difficult for them to move in this uh, society. Plus the social values like which are there in East Asia of uh, filial pity, respect for elders, etc. also got eroded. What you are doing, you are saying we are trying to bring back everything. You are bringing health and wellness, which is one important piece. Second is you are saying emotional and social uh, engagements, even art, uh, libraries, volunteering, uh, spiritual. There are a lot of studies that uh, Bhagwan hai ya nahi hai. This can be a moot point. Lekin usme yakin kaam aata hai. <laughs> so, uh, and for the elderly people, it is very often so. Of course, we also know of studies where a religion can lead to some obsessive compulsive disorders some uh, uh, very restricted or strict view of life or some kind of feeling among the uh, among the uh, non specific gender people like for example the uh, the alternate sexes if they are not accepted in a particular faith community but you have brought all those things there so mandir is something which prateep spoke, spoke of you have brought the mandir you have brought the medical facility and you have got brought the entire social spectrum for them. So great, super. Coming to Raj, 
Raj, you have invested uh, in a big chain of hospitals, which was meant for another uh, uh, another chronological group of uh, uh, patients. What is it that you have brought in through your facilities to to add to what Rajit has already done to handle the problems which we spoke of, Raj? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pawanji. Uh, we basically realized that the scare continuum was a big problem because uh, if you look at uh, uh, you know a few years ago, I think uh, elderly people had two destinations: either a neighborhood doctor, probably if they were lucky, or straight away into a hospital or a nursing home, right? But if you look at the nine yards of the geriatric care, and this is very important for all the participants, is uh, those days of just a hospital and a local clinic is gone because the needs of the elders are pretty much wider than that. To name a few, one is elderly people who go into hospitals uh, either for hospitalization, for supervision, or for a surgery. You know, they get discharged in two, three days. It could be because of technological advancement. But let me tell you, the recuperation actually starts there. They need a very nice controlled uh, you know, supervision for the next at least couple of weeks so that they're back on their feet properly, point number one. Point number two, uh, elderly people uh, who stay at home also require certain recuperation during certain unforeseen times for which they don't have to go to a hospital, which is what typically called as a nursing home in the developed countries. Okay, The third environment, which is out of the hospital, is basically memory care, which is a very, very specialized institution. I want you and the speak, uh, and the attendees to know that you know uh, people with memory care issues can never be uh, co mingled with a normal elderly person because of the repercussions that you have either ways. Okay, extending that uh, discussion further, I think we have separate environment for palliative care and hospice as well, where elders who actually have gone through their treatment cycles, all that they require is possibly pain management and probably uh, comfort care. And ultimately, you know, we are also looking at psychiatric care, which probably is very smaller right now, but obviously may go up as the population size increase. So if you look at the nine yards of geriatric care, what currently we are doing in India is basically looking at probably a clinic spectrum as well as the hospital chain. But there is a huge gap which is falling in between. This is compounded with the fact that, uh, you know, I think most of us have forgotten one point that regeneration of the the family system in India, you know, that's not because children don't want to live with the parents, but obviously the economic uh, criteria are driving people. A person going to the US is because, you know, they have certain greener opportunities and pastures over there. But what is happening is elderly folks living alone do require, have these requirements which are now expanding. Now that is where we came into play and said, look, we found two issues. One, we said families uh, basically are not able to get a very uh, sort of a holistic review of the elder's condition. If there is a knee pain, today what's happening is youngsters are pushing the elders into a straight away. In fact, there was a question on fall which will take later. They straight away go to orthopedic surgeon and we have seen that two out of three cases probably could have been avoided uh, a surgical. But you know, in India, there are certain other compulsions which play into it. Now, ideally, these people require what the traditional family physician concept is. I'm repeating that elderly folks require this family physician concept. It has to be revived. The reason is... Geriatric care, and that's something that's that's where the geriatric specialization come into play, where you look at it holistically and provide the right guidance to the family. So one, we realize that families, especially children, are not able to get that holistic view. There is a football that goes on between Dr. A, Dr. B, Hospital A and Hospital B. Okay. Number two, we realize that elders staying alone and even with their family require specialized environment for them to get back on their feet or probably uh, get the right kind of a treatment or care. Okay, that's what prompted us to get into this care continuum concept. What we do and what we have created is an environment where families reach out to us. They may ask us for home care, they may ask us for uh, institutional care, but we understand the case and provide them the right guidance, keeping in mind the cost, impact and the burden that the family will have. Because there's another beautiful question that's come up in terms of insurance, which we need to address at this point in time. So with this in mind, we said we will provide care for the elderly outside the hospital, be it at home or step down facilities. And therefore, the step down facility has to meet the needs of that particular care that is required. And hence, two, three different categories of facilities are being crafted by us. Amazing. You, you have uh, explained the step down facility utility, also the step up facility utility by telling that many a time people are pushed into surgery because the families do not have the patience 
yep. uh, to go through the entire uh, alternate uh, maybe rehabilitative kind of um, uh, of, a, of a regime and this is a very uh, this is a very real fact and uh, where also your uh, uh, assist, uh, i mean intermediary care uh, like yours can come into being why don't you tell us about the insurance piece also you're talking about and another question in the similar uh, vein has come why don't you answer those questions also no, absolutely i think uh, uh, there was a very interesting question that came up from i think uh, uh, miss agarwal kratika agarwal Uh, I think uh, that was to do with. Uh, I'm sorry. I think this is another question of the insurance. So let me take the insurance question. What's happening today is insurance sector is also evolving. Pawan ji, as we move along, I want the uh, participants to know that today there are some services which happen outside the hospital which still get covered uh, under the insurance policies. I'll say spend a couple of minutes on that. The insurance policies always cover pre-hospitalization and post-hospitalization. as well of course uh, rajit knows a lot about this let me take the uh, chance to articulate a bit on this so when an elderly person is going to go through some surgery 30 to 60 days prior to the surgery or hospitalization and once this person gets discharged 60 to 90 days post discharge there are certain elements of the cost as recommended by the treating physicians are covered by the standard insurance policy now you must be lucky to have a policy which has this coverage number 2 you must also have certain balance left in your insurance policy to actually provide you this cover okay however we are actually far from having a comprehensive policy a policy to cover some of the care elements that will come into play in the life of the elderly there are many uh, institutions which have actually uh, raised this uh, uh, issue with the concern authorities lot of work is happening in the back end in fact recently especially in the last 24 months we have seen certain policies coming out and supporting home care as well however in india we are very much in the nascent stage therefore any service provider who is providing a non hospital services which could be somebody like us as a step down care or home care need to keep cost in mind because it is going to pitch the purse of the users especially the chos who are here who are going to spend money on their parents at some point in time therefore cost has to be kept in mind with, uh, for operators like us but certainly insurance is going to evolve i can tell you in the coming years insurance will come into play now the other side of insurance coming into place while the affordability and the the reach will increase but operators cannot get away with high billing or high cost therefore it is better for operators to keep an eye on your cost right now and allow this insurance industry to mature as we go along example i'll give you uh, infertility treatment for example 10 years back you never had any insurance policy for reproductive medicine but today you have beautiful handcrafted policies which cover maybe even one or two cycles of treatment for folks india will follow the same path for geriatric care as well yeah and this year particularly the insurance companies also uh, should be a little more large hearted in bringing uh, bringing uh, economical schemes for uh, insurance for the elderly because they have had a windfall year because there were hardly any elective surgeries so uh, they have had a windfall profit this year go ahead raj i just want to sorry I, i forgot to mention one point which will be very much of very interest to your participants is that recently we have seen group insurance policies coming up in uh, retirement communities uh, rajit is also a party to some of those policies these what these people like mr rajit and others have done is to bring in group insurance policies for the older persons living in a group community and that's the advantage of how this geriatric care is evolving as we go along absolutely very 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 well put coming to rajit there is a question rajit yeah. uh, it comes from co-founder of kamal sthal health tech where should we hire caregivers from since there is a dearth of geriatric caregivers in the market second question is which is related if caregivers have to work 24 hours in india is is that kind of is are the, that kind of uh, working hours legal permitted rajit so i think uh, capacity and capability building for geriatric care is one of the big themes that the industry and the government is working together there are some solutions uh, which we have found not comprehensive though uh, one is that there are specific training modules available with the national skills council and some hospitals like lana azad in delhi where you can train people on geriatric care there's a big movement on training asha workers right there are specific programs you know coming up even for the home health where there are you know ngos willing to train them up to take care of you know uh, seniors 
that is something that is currently you know in the works of how to increase capacity and capability to be able to serve the geriatric population on the working hours is absolutely illegal to do 24 hours in fact not even advisable forget the law i don't think it's in the interest of the caregiver or the person receiving the care that you have a fatigued caregiver we do maximum 12 hour shifts uh, with appropriate breaks uh, depending on the nature of the patient but 24 hours absolutely out of the window but on the capability side we are working on many solutions one of the non intuitive solutions uh, we have been thinking about is that why don't we pick up the home care givers and do refresher trainings every 3 months and have a system through technology of supervision to be able to phenomenally increase the capacity to give care otherwise you know we keep on recruiting and retraining and recruiting and retraining a home help is sometimes more stable and sometimes also more trusted by the person who wants to receive the care and also by the kith and kin so that is something we are trying to work out and say is it possible to do with the help of some uh, you know um, uh, government interventions to be able to train that workforce so rajit we were discussing the other day with some uh, leaders of the home healthcare industry and this point came up that many a time the patient at home elderly patient at home requires 24 hour care and he doesn't want the caregiver to change yep. that means he wants him to live with live within the home and with her uh, and also this point came that this caregiver is not adequately uh, occupied because after let us say two or three years of uh, two or three hours of caregiving he is basically watching the tv serial with the elderly patient throughout the day so his he should be better utilized so is there some level of a uh, change required in the workmen uh, uh, workmen uh, hours uh, hours uh, whatever legislation is there or regulations are there to allow such caregivers to be there for 24 hours because most most of them are already there for 24 hours yep. rajit so there are two, uh, two possible solutions one is the, the unorganized sector does provide for 24 hours but the working hours are only 8 to 10 the rest is all sleeping eating etc uh, but that's the unorganized sector on the organized side we offer 12 hour shifts but what we are also doing is now able to provide through technology some basic supervision to monitor vitals of the person a remote critical you know uh, critical incidents handling system as well where if there are any escalations a certain number is called and it's a call center manned by doctors and intensivists who will intervene you know virtually and the team leader will go very quickly on the spot to provide cover my humble submission also is that people who require 24 by 7 care perhaps are better off in special facilities because there there is a doctor on site there is constant supervision and holistic care from nutritionally assisted diets to physiotherapy to medical monitoring can be done so i would urge people who need that kind of care uh, they are better off in facilities which are better managed and supervised rather than being at home yeah so there is of course i mean uh, let me bring in the their point also because a person uh, who has seen both sides like you will maybe able to add uh, more color uh, so the point uh, on the other side is that uh, assisted living facilities outside the home are very expensive plus there is a social taboo plus the patient also prefers to be within his home have his autonomy have his autonomy of routine uh be in familiar surroundings etc but most important is the cost piece how is the industry uh preparing to reduce its cost in such a manner that movement from home for all the valid reasons which you suggested to a senior care facility is not uh is not a very big jump financially rajit So I think this entire cost, uh, you know, is a myth. Let me give a very simple example. A twelve-hour nurse costs about sixty thousand rupees if you take from a good quality provider per month. That's the cost of a nurse. 
Add to it the cost of home help, your food, electricity, water, and safety and security for staying alone. Right? Facilities in NCR or even outside NCR in South is even cheaper. Range from fifty thousand to a lakh and fifty thousand a month. All services included, which means nursing care, GDA care, doctor on call, physiotherapy on call, food, GST, staying. That's the range. So I think it's just a myth because in in the in in your own home perhaps the costs are fragmented. So you don't see them together. Fundamental reason is simple. In a in a facility you have shared costs. With a nursing is shared, doctor is shared. So obviously it's going to be cheaper. So I think it's just a myth in our mind that you know these facilities are more expensive than than the house. But having said that, as I said, we as providers have to be very flexible and very sensitive to the need of the person who needs the care. if they feel far more comfortable you know in the house we have to create solutions accordingly so i'm saying we have to be flexible but on a pure economic basis and safety perspective i would bat out for a facility you know on both sides so prateep uh, do you agree with the economic side of uh, rajesh's argument is so, there uh, is uh, is there uh, is it uh, borne out by uh, the realities of the marketplace Uh, yeah, so I'll give you my view on this, right? So, when you look at the assisted living market, right, and you compare it with the US, right, and we did a lot of study of that market just to understand how does it compare, right? The market in India is extremely shallow. So what I mean to say is that you have very few people. So you may say, "Ah, huh, in the south you have a lot of you know assisted living facilities, in the east there are less." You know, you may say all of it. but when you just look at the quantum or the percentage of people who are living in these facilities in india it is absolutely tiny right and and it's people like rajat uh, rajat who are actually making a difference out there and when you look at the market you can either do it the you know that old story of you know someone goes into africa 100 years back and says oh my god no one has shoes so it's a great market for shoes and the other guy says let's not you know sell shoes out there right so it's it's that dichotomy that's that but fundamentally the market is tiny when you look at the market again i think there's this there's a very big pyramid out there right so you have at least in calcutta i'll tell you you have a lot of old age homes which are not very large rooms providing a meal and you almost have you know lots of rooms side by side in which people are paying and and it's probably going to be the lower middle class that is you know sending the parents out there Where people are paying between six thousand rupees to ten thousand rupees per month to look after that person, right? And that's it, right? You have the other one, which is a little more, um, a little better, uh, but more middle class, slightly outskirts of the city, where it's about in 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 a Calcutta, maybe it is about thirty thousand rupees a month, right? And then you have the high end ones, which are you know seventy thousand, you know, and that to that. Uh, depending upon right so the point is that you have that entire spectrum and there are people who are then deciding well, where should they enter right and maybe it is you know the lower hanging fruit is to go after the uh, the, the the slightly more luxury side of it right? because the margins may be better but i think what's going to happen is that you will have the entire market building out there'll be different people right so while there are you know there are four participants you know in the in this panel right now there will be a lot of other people who will come in the market is huge right we talk about the market being you know 10 billion you know what's it i forget the numbers 10 billion dollars in india and then or 6 billion dollar going to 10 you know you have all these numbers thrown up anyone who comes from the outside will say oh my god it's such a great market let's enter once you enter the market you realize how fragmented it is how tiny the margins are how do you need to get scale to actually make money right so once you look at all of it an organized sector being very very big and therefore when you look at this entire market and then you say what is going to pan out in an india yes there will be a huge growth on the on the assisted living you know or aging in what aging in hub that's the word that uh, rohit used you'll have a lot of that going on so the growth will be big but it's still going to take a time for it to become as let's say pervasive in the us right which means to say if i have to sum it up there's an opportunity there's an opportunity for every single type of player to enter the market right there'll be the high end guys who want to enter there'll be the guys who will be very very 
you know, pushing themselves on the medical side who will want to do it. There'll be the people who will be doing the 10,000 rupees, you know, yeah. hole in the wall, uh, David, David Copperfield type homes. You'll have the entire gamut. And that is what the market will start looking like in India. Yeah. So I, uh, I think Rajit, Rajit and you have brought in a very interesting color to this, that uh, there is a, a spectrum of facilities which are available, which are uh, uh, which are are cheaper, and uh, uh, the person who cannot afford a very high class home can go to those. Uh, coming uh, though, there are many more questions which have come up, and plus many other points which I would like to discuss. But that will come in subsequent sessions on uh, senior living. Uh, let me close this uh, session by asking uh, the question. Uh, to Raj. One question has been directly addressed to you, Raj. So please answer that. And what is your, uh, what is the view, what is your view on geriatric medical tourism? Okay, thank you, Pavanji. Uh, I'll start with geriatric, geriatric medical tourism. I think uh, COVID has answered that right now. So there's no moment. So I'm assuming that somebody's talking about elders coming into India. But look, I've been told that the kind of models we are creating can be taken to other countries as well. So obviously, I leave it at that. So geriatric medical tourism at this point in time uh, is something very questionable and uh, it's a very, very nascent uh, stage at this point in time. I will uh, I will take the question of Mr. Uh, uh, Kumar Sampath Kumaran, where he requested uh, me to talk about this uh, preventive health care for elders. A right? <clears throat> couple of points. I think uh, every year I get a call from my car manufacturer or a car dealer saying, look, sir, it's up for uh, you know service. Right. And then I call them and they fix up, they take the car, service and bring it back. Right. The same logic has to be applied to the elderly. Uh, from our uh, the medical board that we have, we are very clear that a thorough review of an elder once a year is important. Now, this is where the problem starts. And, uh, you know, I'm sure all the uh, the, mem uh, the uh, viewers and audience would know that we have gold, platinum, silver, etc. packages when you walk into hospital, right? Now, everybody's going to ask, what am I going to choose this from, right? What is that I'm going to choose? So we have a very simple answer and we do annual health checkup very meticulously, but for our own clientele who ask for it after understanding the value. So let me make it very clear that an annual health checkup for the elderly is as much as very, very relevant as much as for youngsters, number one. Now, is this going to be a very expensive effect? Not at all. It is in a staged manner. The first stage is basically to do some basic assessments, which will not cost you more than a couple of thousand rupees. But once the basic organ functionalities and your cognitive functionality, etc., are tested and reviewed, if the doctor, uh, the reviewing physician believes that you need deeper engagement to review a few other things, obviously they'll step up the level of uh, assessment and diagnosis that is required. So I think a very simple but a very structured annual assessment for the elderly is very, very important as much as we do for cars. That is absolutely not happening in India today. And I think that has to come in and kick in. Great points. Um, I can only say one thing that... Um, uh, the cars analogy, we'll have to find maybe a different one because uh, elder living has been compared with uh, elder warehousing. But you make a great <laughs> point. <laughs> you make a great point that uh, he uh, the health checkup is very important. Yeah. And uh, but uh, uh, just to, because we try to bring in all uh, colors of uh, opinion as friends, we believe that uh, truth comes out when friends debate. So one of the things which is coming up in COVID is as long as it is not broken, don't fix it. Because fixing means exposing to infection. Fixing means exposing to the unscrupulous medical practitioner also who might be having less business today. So might over diagnose here and over treat you. And what is your view on that? No, I think, look, uh, I agree with you, Pavanji. I think overexposure, etc. is uh, highly unwarranted. Today, the, uh, the medical institutions actually have different agendas when you go into uh, for reviews. So I don't want to get into that. That's a separate discussion. But we very clearly insist that elderly folks, irrespective of whether they are young old or old old, to go through an annual review. Now, the annual review is not merely taking blood samples and asking them to run on a treadmill. That's not the point. I'm sure you know that, you know, hearing your dental your eyesight, everything has to be calibrated on an annual basis. So our humble request is that 
the annual health checkup for preventive care has to be a mandatory for everybody uh, and it has to be done meticulously it is not very expensive you don't have to get carried away by the different levels of package etc it starts with a simple analysis go deeper into organs which show problem and here you need to have a trusted partner and that is where you know people have to come out and say i can be your trusted partner and as pratik put it across there will be more people who will come in but the very important factor is how do you create the trust especially with the elderly folks absolutely for what if i can add there yeah go ahead Rab- unfortunately the world has learned to monetize sickness and pay attention to wellness hmm. if we pay this proportionate focus on wellness you know i don't think we'll need the exposure anymore right so our good old asian systems of you know yoga meditation naturopathy paying attention to diet ayurveda home remedies well, i think there is space and need now you know to really start focusing on wellness to avoid the eventual you know sickness syndrome that would be a big step forward i think for any country absolutely uh, rajit and that is a great note to end this discussion on and thank you very much uh, audience once again you stayed stay with us in large numbers despite the uh, the uh, the time commitment we can cannot keep to thoroughly discuss a topic and thank you this uh, panel how well you have held their interest it's really commendable once again uh, passing it on to siddharth now thank you thank you bhavan thank, thank you uh, thank you very much sirs our leaders and i have taken home some excellent nuggets from today's conversation and and very well moderated mr choudhury i'm still receiving positive messages from our leaders over linkedin and over email and they've 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 completely enjoyed today's sessions and thank you to our uh, guests for staying uh, all the way till the end uh, and for sharing excellent questions along with our weekly webinars we will soon be taking these discussions on the exclusive digital uh, community platform which we're curating for leaders uh, we've already begun uh, sending out invitations to select leaders across our four sectors on healthcare energy e mobility and real estate so whether you would like to engage with us through our expert panel uh, or as learners on the platform uh, please do write to us and, uh, um, and and connect with us for membership to join the healthcare circle and also get access to other allied circles on the platform uh, all details are also available on the bluecircle.co and um, thank you once again uh, uh, distinguished panelists and the audience and look forward to having more such sessions like this Thank you all the best thank, thank you very much thanks. bye